Father God, as we come before you today, we prepare to be taught by your Holy Spirit the depth of that name, El Shaddai. And while in our finite minds we will not be able to understand the infinite nature of who you are as God Almighty, would you touch our hearts today with what we can learn and let our hearts be humble and open to how it will change us and our perspective on life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we continue our study of Genesis, I would encourage you to go back, if you missed it last week, and watch Pastor Josh's message on the 16th chapter of Genesis, where we discovered that we have a God who sees, so that when we cry out, we know he hears. But today, we, uh, Josh gave me the assignment. He, he referred to it last week. He said, now, in the coming sermons, we're going to try to cover great big chunks of Genesis. And so the first great big chunk he gave to me because he knew that I could keep it short. <laughs> Chapters 17 through 20. And we're only going to focus in on the first eight verses of chapter 17. But let's review what's going to happen. So you have a context of what's going to happen in chapters 17 through 20. And then discover what do we know about God from all of this that is going to happen. In Genesis 17 to 20, we're going to see the continuing story of the Lord directing Abram's life to become the father of all those who have true faith in God. And in those chapters, the Lord is going to initiate a new covenant with Abram. And he's going to renew the promise he gave to Abram and to Sarai to have a son. And the Lord is going to change Abraham's, Abram's name to Abraham, and he's going to change Sarai's name to Sarah. And then he's going to appear in person as the angel of the Lord to Abraham and Sarah to confirm the timing of Isaac's birth, the promised son. And at that event, the Lord is also going to send angels to rescue Lot from the judgment that is coming on Sodom and Gomorrah for its sin. And Lot's daughters, we're going to read, are going to commit a huge sin of distrust and disbelief in God's authority and his power. And they do something horribly corrupt. And then at the end in chapter 20, we would see if we read through the whole thing that Abraham will again fall into the sin of disbelief in God's authority and power and he will lie to protect his wife. And in each of these stories, the Lord will be revealing himself as gracious and merciful. We will see him as steadfast in love. We will see him as holy and perfect. And we will see him express his justice against all that is not holy and perfect. But at the very beginning of this section of chapters, in chapter 17, the Lord is going to appear to Abram, and he's going to reveal a new name for himself that has not yet been used in the Bible. A brand new name. You just got done singing that name. God introduces himself to Abram as God Almighty, which is the Hebrew phrase, El Shaddai. And understanding that God is almighty is essential to living a life of faith because of this simple context from last week's sermon where Pastor Josh told us we have a God who sees and now God introduces himself as the one who can do something about what he sees. It's one thing to know that God sees and hears my prayers, that we can cry out to him. But it's still another thing to know and have the confidence that he is God Almighty who can do something about it. Let's stand and read the first 18 verses of Genesis 17. 
I read from the English Standard Version. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. You may be seated. Now in the opening words of that chapter, we're told how old Abraham, Abram is. He's 99. If you do your math, you know that it's been 13 years then since the last time God spoke to Abram when Ishmael was born. For Ishmael was born when Abram was 86 years old. So it's been 13 years that God has been silent 13 years. Why does God remain silent? Why is it that sometimes we feel like we've asked and asked and asked and asked and God is silent? Well, we must foundationally make sure that we don't define silence as inactivity. Just because we have not heard from God specifically does not mean God is not working. God is always active. And his silence may be for a variety of reasons. Some of his silence may be a response to our present spiritual condition. Some of God's silence may be be because he is testing us All of his silence is for our growth, as we will see. Some of the reasons God might be silent in your life today is maybe it's because you're not looking for him. Maybe you're like Abraham, who's just looking for a solution and then willing to invest his own energy and his own resources in that solution And take a second wife and have a son outside of God's promise. Maybe you're not looking for God. Evangelist Billy Sunday in the old days used to say that a sinner can't find God for the same reason that a criminal can't find a policeman. He's not looking. Sin makes us turn a deaf ear to God. So even though God may be speaking... He appears silent because we're really not looking. But there may be other reasons that God is silent. Sometimes God is silent because we aren't ready for the message he has for us. He wants to talk to us about something, but we aren't ready to listen to his perspective. We only want him to validate our perspective. And so we must go through refining trials to make us ready to truly listen to him. God is sometimes silent because he knows we aren't ready to or willing to obey him once we do hear his message. God is always ready to show us what his will is and his purpose is, but he shows his will only to those who are ready to do it. He doesn't play, let's make a deal. He doesn't have three doors of options, one of which is going to be his will, and you get to choose which one you think will be best for you. He offers you his will when he knows that you have already chosen that's the only door 
that you will open. And, in, and finally, sometimes God is silent so that he might test us. To teach us the importance of trusting him for the long haul because we know he has declared he is El Shaddai, the God Almighty who never stops working. And sometimes we get frustrated with the amount of time it takes for us to pass the test before he finally says, you're ready. But God is working. He is God Almighty. He not only sees, but he is doing something about what he sees. Waiting teaches us to trust God's sovereignty rather than to try to force the outcome through our means. And this was the case in Abram's life. He had stopped listening to God and instead had listened to the advice of his wife of how to produce the promised son. Rather than trust God to fulfill his promise, he took matters into his own hands. And so for the last 13 years, Abram has been content to think that the issue of his heir has been resolved. I have Ishmael. God told, him to bring, told me to bring him back into my household and to raise him as my son. Therefore, this must be the plan. I helped God get it done. But as we learned last week, we have a God who sees, and he sees it all in the context of his divine will and purpose. So that even when we wander from his purpose, as Abram did, and even as we choose not to trust his promises, as Abram did, he remains faithful. God is waiting for the right time to act again. And his silence helps restore our faith and make us ready to listen and obey in complete compliance to him. God is silent until he sees that we are ready to trust him. So are you ready to trust him so you can hear him again? So let's walk through what happens in just these eight verses. And then you can take the rest of the 17th chapter through chapter 20 and study it this week on your own in light of this. How did God reveal himself as God Almighty now that he has spoken again? So point number one this morning is this. God does end his silence. Isn't that good news? God ends his silence. Thirteen years after Abram's attempt to fulfill God's promise, when he's 99 years old, God appears to Abram. And he ends his silence, however, only when Abram has exhausted all his physical ability to influence the outcome. Thirteen years ago, Abram was still able to plant the seed in a woman who was barren and who miraculously now is getting ready to give birth. But both of them, we will see in a moment, were incapable of, in their own physical being, having any more children. God will reveal his power to us only after we have exhausted all of our own resources, all of our own power, all of our own input, and when we come to the end of ourselves... God's opportunity arrives after man's extremity has been reached. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul as he describes this. As he describes Abraham at 99 years of age, not at 86 years of age. The Apostle Paul in Romans 4 says this, That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Notice the context. He's telling us that in the life of Abraham, everything was dead and it did not exist 
the capacity for Abraham to have another child did not exist. And yet God is going to call into existence, just as he did when he created this world, that which does not exist. Verse 18, in hope he believed against hope that he should be the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's the foundation of the words El Shaddai, God Almighty. Do you have confidence that he is able to accomplish whatever he has said, no matter how long he appears to be silent? God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that we could even ask or imagine. Do you have that confidence that now describes Abram at 99 years of age that was not true of him 13 years earlier? God's silence transformed Abram's heart so his spirit was now ready to hear and obey what God said. God will end his silence only when grace will be exalted. Did you hear what Paul said? It's only when grace could be the foundation of everything that gets done that God is going to do anything. Grace is not exalted when we believe we either deserve it or if we believe we can assist God in accomplishing it, just like Abram did. It's only when he came to the end of himself and said, I have nothing to offer. I need your grace to save me. I need your grace to fulfill your promise for me. You are not saved by your helping God to get you saved. You are saved only by the admission of your total, absolute need for salvation and your inability to do anything about it. And you cry out to God Almighty and he saves you by grace. God ends his silence when he will be completely glorified because God never shares his glory. So it's only when we say, I have nothing to do with this, so I get no credit, that God saves. There's a song that has come out in the last few years by Sanctus Real, and it's called, My God is Still the Same. And in one of the verses, there's a line, two lines that go like this. Just ask the words you prayed in desperation if they're heard. They'll say, my God is still the same. Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not once did he ever stop proving our God is in control. Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not once did he ever stop proving our God is in control. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will. My God is still the same. When did he lose his power? When did his mercy change? Never has, never will. My God is still the same the same. Can you declare that today, even if he's being silent to you? My God is still the same, and he is in control. So that when God breaks his silence, you are ready to listen, because life is about to change. And life changes when we understand the nature of God that he will reveal to us after his silence. Because he comes to Abram and he says, I am God Almighty. The Lord says he is El Shaddai. Abraham needed 13 years to come to an understanding that God was bigger than just the God who sees. Abraham needed correction. He needed further instruction on who God is. You see, Abram didn't understand that God is Almighty. And that he's able to do everything he says. It just may not happen in the time frame that we think it should. 
Abraham had not trusted God's power to accomplish his purpose without human assistance. And let me ask you at this point to be very clear in your notes that you're taking to reflect on this this week. How many things going on in your life right now are you taking control of because you think the outcome needs to come faster than God has planned? How many ways are you investing your energy, your wisdom, your experience in accomplishing things that you think God has promised you, but they aren't happening fast enough? How many things do you need to surrender again to Almighty God and wait on His timing? Abraham had not trusted that. Abraham had resorted to unlawful and self-serving means to promote the plan of God. Now, it may have been culturally relevant or acceptable for him to take Hagar as his second wife so he could have an heir through her, but it certainly was unlawful to God who said marriage is between one man and one woman for life, forever, and you work as hard as you can all the time to make sure that you preserve it, no matter how much it hurts you and no matter how much sacrifice you have to make. You don't quit on your spouse ever. Abraham needed to consider fully the God who is all-gracious, all-powerful, and all-sufficient. Abraham needed correction so he could trust the Almighty God who is now revealing himself. And Abraham needed a fresh experience of the steadfast love of God. And he's going to see that in the chapters ahead and we're not going to take the time to go through them, but we're going to see that nothing could separate Abram from God's love in his covenant he made with him because we're going to see Abram fail again and again and again in the coming chapters. We're going to see him lie about Sarah to Abimelech because he was afraid that Abimelech might take this beautiful woman as his own wife and he didn't want to fight Abimelech for her so he just said, well, she's actually my sister which was in part true because in the the Hebrew language the word sister can also mean some other relative and Sarah was Abram's niece. You remember, Sarah was the daughter of Abram's brother. So he married his niece. So when he told Abimelech, this isn't my wife, this is my sister, he wasn't lying, but he, uh, he was lying because he did it for the wrong reason, to protect himself. We're going to see him fail, but what do we see God doing? God works it all out anyway because God has revealed himself as the almighty God and now he's going to prove it to you if you will just trust him. Abraham needed an answer that only God in his might could provide. Both Abram and Sarai were dead to childbearing. Sarai had never been able to bear children. Abram was now impotent. And the power of God Almighty is revealed when we admit we have no power. And Abram needed that lesson. And Abram was asked by God to put his faith into action. Look at verse 1 again where God says, I am, the God, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless so that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Abram is told, I will gladly make my covenant with you and reveal all of my purpose to you and all of my power to accomplish it if you will do two things. Trust me and be transparent about everything. Walk before me and be blameless. Don't hide anything. Don't hide your sin. Open it all up before me. Be transparent so you can be blameless, forgiven by my blood that I shed on Calvary. Jesus is calling you to transparency today and openness. And if you do that, God gave Abram a promise. If you trust me to that level, these are my words, to, 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 to uh, just kind of summarize what God said. If you trust me to that level of complete confidence in my ability to accomplish my purpose and you commit to not doing things your way, I will make a covenant with you and multiply you greatly. And so what does Abram do? He falls on his face before God and puts his faith in him. He's overwhelmed after 13 years by God's grace that you've shown up again and you've said to me, 
you did it your way, now will you let me do it my way? That, he, that God was willing to do that, and he's willing to do that with you. No matter how long you've been doing it your way, God is willing to let you, let him do it his way. And he's calling you to that today. Will you surrender your way and ask God to do it his way? He's overwhelmed with God's grace, and he's so convinced that God is the almighty God that he, in surrender, falls on his face before God. Now look what God does. Almighty God accepts Abram's commitment and establishes his covenant. This is grace in its fullness for us because the Lord immediately establishes his covenant because, get this, guys, grace does not require a proving period. Grace does not require a proving period. Isn't that powerful teaching? That when you fall on your face before Almighty God and you say, I surrender all my ways and I take up your ways, I won't do it perfectly. I can't do it perfectly. I'm going to fail again, but I am surrendered and committed to trusting you as the one who has the plan and I will follow your plan. I'm all in, God. I'm all in. God says, in some people's books, God says, well, we'll see. Let's see how long you can measure up to that before I really give you the promises again. No. Grace is immediate when there is surrender. Grace is immediate. And he changes at that point. He changes Abram's name to Abraham. He'll change Sarai's name later. Uh, but Abram's name used to mean exalted father. You're going to be the father of a nation. You're going to be the father of many peoples. You're going to be the exalted father of them. Abraham extends that to mean you are the father of multitudes, not just one nation, all the people of the world who have faith in God. We originated in Abraham. Our faith did. You may not be genealogically connected to Abraham, but spiritually you are as children of the same faith that God is the Almighty God. And then God Almighty gives Abraham seven covenant promises that cannot be broken. Broken. This is an interesting study. We don't have time to go into it. I'm going to give it to you anyway. They're in the notes if you get them off the Church Center app so you can study them yourself and see how it applies to your view of what's going to happen in the future with the nation of Israel in this world as Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom. You can see if these covenants to you are still valid or not. God declares that this is an eternal covenant to the people of my possession. So to the nation of Israel, these covenant promises are still in effect. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, he said to Abraham. I will make nations of you. I will establish my covenant with you and all generations to follow you. I will give you all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. There's one that hasn't been fulfilled yet. I will be the God of all your people. There's one that isn't being fulfilled right now. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant. There's one that's not being realized and recognized by the people of Israel right now. And I will establish my covenant with Isaac and his descendants for all generations, not Ishmael. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter what you think, this unconditional covenant of God no matter what culture tries to tell us and no matter what politics try to tell us, this unconditional covenant of God will only be fulfilled through the direct descendants of Isaac, not the descendants of Ishmael. They are not children of the promise. Only Isaac is. And God says, this is an everlasting covenant. And I am the God Almighty who will fulfill it. And Abraham confirms his trust in God Almighty and the acceptance of that covenant by being circumcised. Abraham was willing to endure the pain and the suffering of sacrificing himself for the sake of trusting God Almighty. There's things going on in your life right now where you feel like God is silent, he's not answering. 
And part of it is maybe because you're not willing to surrender completely to obeying God, whatever he says, because you have contemplated the cost of obeying God and said that's too high a price to pay. Abraham said there's no cost too high to pay. I'm 99 years old, this is going to hurt. My whole household of men, this is going to hurt. For the next period of time, while we all heal, there's going to be nobody to defend our little clan of people out here in the wilderness. We'll have no army. We'll have no way of defending ourselves. Anybody could overthrow us at any moment. It looks hopeless. We have no way of trusting in our own ability to care for ourselves. We're putting ourselves in a vulnerable position for the sake of declaring our trust in Almighty God and God fulfilled his promise because nothing happened to them and he'll do the same for you if you will make yourself vulnerable and let go of all your control so that you can hear from God again and he will do marvelous things. Abraham's confidence in God Almighty is going to grow as he will continue to walk with God even though he knows and we know from reading the story that he isn't going to be completely blameless, we know that he has made a commitment to walk with God as the friend of God. And Abraham is going to learn God's grace. Abraham is going to learn God's justice at Sodom and Gomorrah, the grace of God that rescued Lot and his family, most of them, and the justice of God that destroyed all the sin that is opposed to him. And Abraham is going to learn about God's faithfulness as God Almighty when he lies to Abimelech and yet God saves him from that situation of shame and embarrassment. And my friends, even though God may seem silent to you right now, you must remember this closing point. El Shaddai, God Almighty, can be trusted to fulfill his promises no matter how long he seems to be silent because he is always working. God can be trusted to fulfill his promises if you will surrender and obey. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for walking us through this brief eight verses and teaching us an incredible lesson that your silence is not permission for us to act. Your silence is not a reference to your inability or your inactivity. Your silence is so that we will come to a fuller and deeper understanding that you can be trusted because when you speak again to invite us to participate in your activity, it will be glorious beyond our imagination. Greater, greater are you, O oh God, than all the things in our lives, than all the gods we worship of our possessions, our pride, our positions, our personality, our abilities, our wisdom, our experiences. Greater are you, God, than all of that. You are to be feared and worshipped above all gods, even when it appears that you're not active, we commit ourselves today to believe that you are. And we wait for your invitation to join you in what you're doing. And we will join you with full commitment to whatever you ask us to do, because you are greater. Please stand.